The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your Bible to the 95th Psalm, I want to take a moment to call your attention to one more announcement in your bulletin. In the back, you may have noticed uh, it's that time of year. The Missions Committee has met and has set our uh, CBF Global Missions offering goal this year, uh, $6,000 with a challenge goal of $7,000. Uh, we'll be taking that offering up through all the way through Christmas, which means all the way to January 6th. You may or may not know that's the last day of Christmas. Uh, but there's an added little bonus, let's say, uh, dreamed up by you know, my wife, so I have to thank her for this. Um, if we can raise our goal of $6,000 by Christmas Eve, I will preach that morning in one of those you know, very stylish, classy, Christmas suits. You know, the ones with the gingerbread and the snowman and all that kind of tasteful stuff all over it. But there's an added bonus. If we get our challenge goal, Pat and I will both wear one. Not the same one together, separate ones. But for 10000 they might, you know, we, we, might, we might find one we can both fit in. So, um, But be aware of that. Uh, it's a great thing. You'll be hearing more about the offering for global missions. You'll be seeing more about it. Uh, we, I, it's just one of the things we do as church, that we do as people who are called Cooperative Baptist. I think that's it's the reason we do what we do, and particularly this, this season of life uh, for our missionaries, our field personnel, it is extremely important. We support this offering to them, and so I pray that uh, you will respond and that you'll be praying about how God may lead you, uh, tacky suits or not, uh, to give uh, to that offering. But let us look now at the 95th Psalm, uh, verses 1 uh, through the first half of verse 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and the dry land which His hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we hear your words that change us, call us, and shape us. While whatever words, Lord, I may add, will be quickly forgotten and fade away. Holy Spirit, shape us now more into the likeness of our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Speak to us, we pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> it's been a good morning of worship, yes? Have you ever stopped to think, though, about all this stuff that we do in this room on Sunday mornings? I mean, really, have you ever stopped to think about it? The stuff we do each and every week in this room. I mean, isn't it just a bit odd? Have you ever disconnected yourself from it and really thought about it? I mean, really, have you ever stopped to think about what we do each and every Sunday, or at least what most of us do on some Sundays? We get up at a regular time. Some of us, most of us maybe set an alarm clock. On a day we have off from work, we set an alarm clock. We get up, we get dressed in clothes we would otherwise reserve for more special occasions, you know, like funerals, school pictures, parole hearings, whatever. We gather with a bunch of other people in one room. Some people we like, some people we don't like, some people we know, some people we don't know, some folks we're kin to, some folks we wish we weren't kin to. And we sit on benches and we sing songs together, listen to people read from a book that most of us have probably read already a few times ourselves or, or can't really bother with the time to read sometimes. 
And then you got to listen to me. Or maybe, if you're lucky, somebody else. Talk. And talk for as long as it would take to watch a rerun of Seinfeld. And as if all that wasn't odd enough, at some point, every single week, we pass around two brass plates and we ask you to put money in it so that we can do it again next week. And the week after that. And then that we can take some of that money and send it to other people to do this same sort of thing this week and next week and the week after that. It's a bit odd. Of course, the oddest thing about all of it may be that well, we do it all the time. Every week. It's not just an annual gathering. It's not just quarterly or monthly. But in this place, this congregation, for as best as we know, for at least nearly every single week over the last 167 years, and as far as we can tell, for the next 167 years, we come together every single week to do the same thing. It's a bit odd. Of course, to those who've always gone to church or those who've been a part of a church for most of their lives, nothing about it seems strange at all, does it? Just what you do. But to the untrained, to the uninitiated, I suppose it might seem a, a bit nonsensical. At least that was what I used to think. That was the impression I used to have when I'd try to remove myself and think about what is this thing that we do every week? And then I heard about something called the Sunday Assembly. Now, Sunday assembly may sound like the latest Pentecostal congregation gathered on metal folding chairs next to the old Kmart, but that's not what it is. In fact, it may be the furthest thing from that. Because if you and I uh, were to walk into a gathering of the Sunday assembly, we wouldn't think it was all that different, at least not at first. I mean, to tell the truth, what they do at Sunday assembly doesn't look too different from what we do every Sunday. What's interesting about it, to me at least, is Sunday Assembly began the day that I began here on Sunday, January 6th of 2013 in the Islington Borough of North London. These two people, uh, two stand-up comedians actually, Sanderson Jones and Pippa Evans, they were talking and said, you know, it's Sunday. I really feel like we need a gathering of people, of like-minded people who will come together to create a sense of community, to share our resources for, for the common good, to sing songs, to hear someone talk and inspire us to make the world a better place. In fact, if you go on their website, the Sunday Assembly's motto or mission statement is live better, help often, wonder more. I think that's great. Sounds a little bit like a breakfast cereal, but it sounds great. That first time the Sunday Assembly met, they met in a decommissioned church that's called the Nave now, in that little borough. Right next door was a church, St. Jude and St. Paul's Church. Now the Sunday Assembly on their first meeting had about 200 people. St. Jude and St. Paul's had about 30 people. The next time the Sunday Assembly met, they had over 300 people. And more were emailing and texting and sending Facebook messages asking the people who started, how do we get one of these going where we are? And now, right now, in just less than five short years, there are now 70 chapters of the Sunday Assembly meeting in eight countries. It's really something else. No, really, it, it's something else. Because the one thing that Sunday Assembly is not is a church. In fact, they're very intentional about not being a church. Because the Sunday assembly is intentionally non-religious. In other words, it's really a gathering for atheists, agnostics, secular humanists, doubters, whatever label they want, or for anyone who wants to come, but they can't and don't bring religion. They like to use the model of a Sunday church service to come together, to feel inspired, to share in community, and to make the world a better place. These Sunday assemblies have all the same parts, uh, may even look and feel the same as a Sunday morning worship service, but it intentionally isn't. So what really makes it all that different? 
It's got all the same parts, all the same pieces. People come away with the same language, saying the same things. I feel encouraged. I feel fed. I feel inspired. They come away with the same language. I've heard that same language, the language of worship, tossed around about other things, other things especially this time of year, especially this weekend of every year. I mean, think about it. It sounds a lot like church, doesn't it? Folks get up early on a day they might otherwise have off from work. Some of them may even take the day off. Some get dressed in clothes they wouldn't necessarily wear during the week. They gather together in one place with a crowd of other folks. Some they like, some they don't like, some they know, some they don't know, some they're kin to, some they wish they weren't kin to. And they sit on benches. They sing songs together. May even come away saying, boy, I really feel inspired or encouraged. Of course, some of the biggest differences between those kind of events and what we do every week is that some folks who go to those will spend more money on one of those then they'll give to the church the whole year. Or, or they'll drive for hours. Drive for hours, rain or shine, to get there. They'll gladly sit or stand for the well over allotted hour that we're giving in church, and they'll never complain about how hot or cold it is, whether or not they can hear the speakers, whether or not anything is just as it is. They'll do it. And maybe when it's over, They'll tell everybody about how, what a time they had, what moved them. They may talk about it that day. They may talk about it all week. They may even talk about it for years to come. Some will come away saying it was a religious experience. But most of us call it what it is. It's just a football game. It may have all the elements of what we do here each and every week. Where they may be gathering together. People may be singing songs. There may be fellowship. A united cause and purpose. But it's clearly not the same thing, right? Please tell me you know it's not the same thing, right? Okay. Because if it is, I'm quitting now. So what really makes it different? I mean, if it has all the same parts and pieces, what really makes it different? Now, if you want to talk about different, just take a short drive into town right now, and you'd likely find a few places that look different, where folks are gathered. They might look a little bit the same on the outside, maybe brick, white trim, maybe even a steeple. But inside, inside it'd look and feel a lot different. While they might have a, a grand pipe organ, They might have ministers wearing elaborate vestments. Today they'd be white and gold. Or they might be wearing black robes with floor-length stoles. They might have a robed choir with a small orchestra with a string uh, uh, ensemble. Or they might have a five-piece rock band. Their minister might be wearing skinny jeans and print t-shirts. Or he might be wearing an old polyester suit he bought in the 70s that doesn't fit him anymore. They might be gathered in a stone building with fine stained glass windows, singing ancient hymns, or they might be in a living room, passing around a coffee cup with a little bit of wine and a loaf of pita bread. They may not even sing together. They may not even sit on benches. They may not even get dressed up. They may not even have to listen to a single person talk. But we have far more in common with them than we do those folks who gather for meetings of the Sunday assembly or the collective crowd at a college football game. So what is it? What is it that makes us the same as them, though the parts and pieces all look different? What if if instead of getting in your car you drove to town, what if you could get in a, a time machine? I fell asleep last night watching Back to the Future. It may have leaked into the sermon a little bit. What if you could get into a time machine? Wind the clock back several centuries. Back even before Jesus' birth. What if you could turn the pages of Scripture all the way back to the time of the psalmist? Not just the words. To the time of that grand temple in Jerusalem. A time when the people of God did not gather in one place one day a week to sit on benches and sing songs, but rather came with their lambs and their goats and their grain on their backs, to give to a priest, to be slaughtered on an altar, to have blood sprinkled and splashed everywhere, to have their grain burnt up in front of them. 
It doesn't sound remotely like anything we do, or at least nothing we've done in the last five years. I don't know what y'all did before that. But it doesn't sound like anything we do today. But the truth is we have more in common with them than we do with those societies and organizations that have co-opted the ways and means of contemporary congregational life. But how is it? How is it that we are more like those ancient Hebrews with their lamb slaughtering, grain burning, blood splattering, festival celebrating ways than those groups who gather together to sing songs and pass the plate? What is it? Can't you hear it in the words of this enthronement psalm we've sang, we've read, we've heard this morning? Oh, come, let us sing, to sing to hear our own voices, to sing so that we may, may clap and applaud ourselves? No. What does the psalmist say? Oh, sing to the Lord. Let us make, uh, the English just doesn't do it right. Let us make a joyful noise. The Hebrew word is almost like, let us just like throw up our voices. To, when we can't do anything else, to just shout. Us Baptists don't do that a whole lot. We find it improper. But make a joyful noise. Why? Because we're happy, because we're excited, because we're encouraged. We do it to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into the room where it's nice and air-conditioned or heated, where it's comfortable with, with cushions on the pews. Let us come. No. Let us come where, the psalmist says, into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Why, the psalmist says, for the Lord is a great God. A great king above all gods. And then he uses this creation language. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The height of the mountains are his. The sea is his for he made it. The dry land he formed it. Oh come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. The sheep of his hand. What makes it different? Can't you hear it? What makes us different from the gathering of Non-religious folk. What makes what we do different from what a crowd at a college football game claims to experience? How is it that we who are gathered here who call ourselves Baptist, uh, whether it's cooperative or otherwise, what, how is it that what we do is the same as our Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Methodist, High Church, House Church, Contemporary, or Traditional brothers and sisters? What makes what we do the same as our ancient counterparts' acts of animal sacrifice and burnt offerings? It's the very reality that what we are doing is not about us. That what we are doing is about proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And nothing else comes over. What we do week after week, and here's the thing that, that really gets me, it is every week, and I'm going to tell you something, it's every week whether you're here or not, it's here every week whether I'm here or not, it's every week, it's fascinating, some of you weren't here last week and you won't be here next week, some folks who were here last week aren't here now, some folks who will be here next week won't be here now, but guess what, every week, week after week, we create the opportunity for the declaration of the reign of God. Yes, creating community is a part of what we do. Yes, gathering around the table for fellowship and food is part of what we do. Yes, singing together is part of what we do. Learning the Bible together is a wonderful part of what we do. And yes, being inspired to make the world a better place is definitely part of what we do. But the ultimate reason we are here in this room each and every week, the reason we do this over and over again, week after week, month after month, year after year, generation after generation, is that we need to be reminded of that deep truth that the one who set the stars on fire the one who spins the earth on its axis, the one who raised the mountains and filled the oceans, is the one who calls us ever into life. It's the one who calls us into a deeper and deeper relationship with God, God's self. We need to be reminded of that. We gather to partake in these otherwise odd practices 
as a way to remind ourselves that God still reigns. That when it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket, when we have grown too confident in our own abilities to manipulate and control our lives or the lives of others, when the sky grows dark and the way and the path seems lost, when we feel like we are untouchable, when we feel we are too righteous to be wrong or too sinful to be saved, we need to be reminded that God still reigns. That God is still in control. That Christ is still king. And not us. And no one else. Worship isn't about coming together because it's the right thing to do. It isn't about coming together to hear good music and okay preaching, to hear funny stories, or to check some box on our list of self-righteousness. Worship is about giving to God that which is only for God, that which only God deserves. The praise, adoration, and recognition of the Lord of all lords the King of all kings, the God, the one true God who is above everything else that we may ever consider divine. That's what worship is about. And we do it every week. Because, friends, sometimes you come in and it's 11 o'clock and you get in the car and you go to Baja because, man, it's Sunday. Sometimes you come in, you don't hear anything else because you know you got that meeting tomorrow. You know you got that thing you got to do tomorrow, and it's on your mind even right now. Sometimes you come in because yesterday was just awful. You had a fight with the kids, you had a fight with your spouse, and you still aren't over it, and here you are, but you're just here. And some weeks, it's just a little blip on the radar. You're just going through the motions. But then there are those times when a word from Scripture catches your ear, a line from a song, the sight of of Shirley Justice handing a kid a stick of bubble gum, the sight of, of people hugging one another and telling them how much they missed them, or that time when you put money in the plate when you know you don't have enough to get to Friday and you do it anyway. There are those times when you need it. And God speaks and God reminds you, you're not in control. No one else is. No one else is worthy of this time and this place except God and God alone. And you're reminded that God reigns, that Christ is king, and we are not, and no one else is. And we hear the words of the psalmist. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Praise be to God, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Would you pray with me? Holy God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Lord, we are in this place this morning with whatever weight we have brought, whatever concerns are piled on our souls, whatever joys, whatever arrogance, whatever humility. But God, we are here. And we are here, Lord, to worship you. Help us, Lord, to recognize your presence, to give you what only you deserve. All our praise, all our worship. And God, as you move in this place, as you speak to us, help us, Lord, to continue to worship in this moment and the ones hereafter as we gather every week, as we gather to praise you, our King. Move among us now, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.